so i didn't disclose the topic beforehand uh, because um, uh, i just wanted to <laughs> keep it a sort of a you know um, a secret before i reveal i would uh, take this opportunity today to talk about this very um, what you call this is very infrequently uh, presented in the ed i think but nevertheless when it presents it can uh, pose a diagnostic challenge and that is uh, the uh, you know the the clinical feature of nystagmus so our today's talk would be focused on uh, nystagmus okay so how many of you ever had a chance to see or you know sort of uh, investigate a child who has got nystagmus anyone just from your past experiences once in a lifetime or whenever like you know in the near or the distant past anybody who had an, any chance of seeing or dealing with a child who had nystagmus no never never okay diana did you see ever i, I have seen and i think um the child was already under ophthalmology so i didn't have any personal input per se okay fine uh what about the others like uh i don't know the others are mostly i think junior doctors but anyhow uh sometimes you know um, you know experience doesn't look at the sort of uh you know age or you know where you are in your uh career i mean sometimes you can see these cases even as a medical student so what about the others have you ever had a chance to see For me, not at all. Okay, fine. So I think I would take that like as a sort of a no. If other people are silent, probably they haven't seen. So let me start with a very basic definition. So nystagmus basically is a repetitive, jerky movements of the eyeballs. So repetitive, jerky, and involuntary. Okay. So let me add these three things. Eyeballs. So three things here if you look like repetitive jerky and involuntary so repetitive means that like you know it is not like a one-off a single movement which occurs now and then may occur like after two or three hours it's a sort of a repetitive so like it's constantly occurring jerky so it's not as like a slow drifting or you know sort of a gaze fixation you know sometimes which is a usually a part of a seizure or something so it's not gaze fixation where one child is just like you know turning eyes in one direction and just fixing you know, you know the the sight in that particular direction it's more of a jerky moment so like rapidly occurring jerky movements in any it could be in any plane it could be horizontal it could be vertical or sometimes it could be rotatory as well and then it could be symmetric or asymmetric as well i mean this is also important i mean we say when we say eyeballs most of the times like 95 percent of the times this would be bilateral nystagmus like it's occurring in both but sometimes it can occur in one eye as well and i will come in the, like those conditions in which usually the nystagmus is unilateral uh, but as I said, bilateral is more. 95 times like out of 100, you will see this bilateral. So repetitive, jerky and involuntary. It is not happening, you know, if somebody, you can jerk your eyes in one direction, you can mimic it. Like, for example, if you are a good like drama artist or something, you can do it like on purpose as well. But these movements are involuntary. These are not in the control of the child. It is happening spontaneously without any sort of a cortical inputs like without any voluntary control so repetitive jerky involuntary if these three things are present in eyeball movements whether unilateral or bilateral that is nystagmus now coming down to why nystagmus occurs because if we have to deal with nystagmus cases i think we need to know what could be the reasons for nystagmus and where you know we should jump in and do some sort of uh, needed investigations so basically i would i would classify them in basically two parts like one is i would call it physiological and pathological so one is physiological so you'd say physio yes physiological it can occur normally as well so basically we divide them into physiological and pathological now what is physiological now physiological nystagmus we all can have nystagmus try uh, to let's say take a mobile phone with a good front camera put it in front of yourself uh, hit the record uh, video button and just try to fix your gaze in one direction let's say look to your extreme left 
or you look to your extreme right okay and fix your gaze there for a few seconds and record yourself and you'll see that at the very extreme of the gaze looking at extreme left or extreme right like you're keeping your neck straight and if you look left or you look right after a few seconds you'll see that there are jerky movements of the eyeballs and that is what we call as physiological nystagmus when I, when you say, see if you are doing a sort of a neurological examination and you are looking at the cranial nerve 3, 4 and 6 you know normally we make we ask them to keep their neck straight and we just move the fingers across you know their eye side and we say okay well fine just follow my eyes with your uh, just follow my fingers with your eyes and don't move your neck and we make this sort of an etch so if you try to take your finger to the extreme and the child is looking you will see that there is a little bit of nystagmus at the very end of the gaze so there will be slight like jerky movements of the eyeballs either in the left or the right direction both like basically tuckers in both directions when there is like fixation of gaze in those and we call it physiological nystagmus now why physiological nystagmus occurs if you let those of you who travel in the train you know coming from london or somewhere to medway hospital and you are such a, you are sitting next to the window screen and you are just like you know enjoying the scenery outside and all of a sudden a train from the opposite direction just like crosses your train on the opposite tracks so all of a sudden you know the bogies they are just passing in front of you now if you try to record that you know when you are looking at the train passing across your train through the window and you record yourself through as you will see that your eyes would be having nystagmus why because you are trying to fix your eyes on a particular object which is moving so it tries to follow it till the eyes come back to the same center spot where another bogey is passing and it fixes on that so we call it like optokinetic nystagmus is a form of a physiological optokinetic nystagmus basically optokinetic nystagmus um, is uh, a nystagmus which occurs physiologically and it occurs when you know when you are trying to fix your gaze on a moving object and remember every nystagmus move because of jerky movements there are two components of that movement like see if if i look at my fingers if they are jerking let's say in i'm sitting so you're seeing so it's my right side let's say if they are jerking like this so one is a movement of this going in one direction and then coming back moving to the side and then coming back to the normal position moving to the side and coming back to the normal position so there are two parts of this movement so one is known as the pursuit the other is known as the second pursuit like when you follow it to the extreme of the case and then back to the center where you started from so pursuit and then when it comes back that is known as second pursuit second so there are two basic movements in a nystagmus one is known as pursuit number two is known as second so pursuit and saccadic movement so pursuit is when let's say the train is coming from the opposite direction so you look at the bogey one which is like just passed through so your eyes would follow it till it can no longer you know see it and then it comes back so it's going quickly as the object is passing pursuit and then it comes back second and then again the next book is passing pursuit and second so these pursuit and saccadic movements are part of the nystagmus so remember because nystagmus is a jerky movement one part of that jerk is known as pursuit the initial and the one that brings it back to the uh, center which is known as the second so physiologically nystagmus does occur and that occurs number one when we are looking at the extreme of our gaze extreme gaze fixation on one side you can will see nystagmus or the other thing is when our eyes are trying to watch something or tries to fix our you know eyesight on something which is move, moving so that is known as optokinetic nystagmus and optokinetic nystagmus here i would like to um, tell you a very interesting thing people who are doing this malingering you know finding different types of uh, illnesses and especially if they are finding uh, an eyesight problem like some all of a sudden somebody comes and say i can't see anything okay i've got totally blind. how would you know that person actually can't see 
or is actually malingering i mean he is actually telling you false he can see everything and some people are quite smart i mean they can tell you very shine i can't see anything this and that okay and they won't blink it so basically a opt optokinetic nystagmus test if you take a drum which has got black and white stripes and let's say if that is brought in front of the patient it's basically an eye instrument so you just say okay you just look at the drum and you rotate the drum and you look at the person's eye so if the person's eye is showing nystagmus while the drum is rotating and he say he can't say anything he is lying because you can only have you know this optokinetic nystagmus if you've got a good eyesight because you can fix your eyesight on something which is moving if somebody says i cannot see anything but the eye is having optokinetic nystagmus on a rotatory drum let's say which has got black and white stripes that person is like that's straight you say okay well fine uh, he can see very clearly all these like making up the things so physiological two things number one in gaze direction number two optokinetic nystagmus so this is known as physiological uh, nystagmus okay now uh, coming down to the uh, pathological uh, nystagmus so uh, let me move on to the next slide and let's talk about pathological so pathological nystagmus let's talk about this one now pathological nystagmus basically again for sake of clarity and again um, there are different different ways of describing that i would just use the one that is used uh, gupta can you just turn off the mic please okay one second as we sorry okay wow. no worries i will just i will just stop here for a still you guys can just look okay. now coming down to pathological nystagmus okay again we have discussed physiological nystagmus are coming up now pathological nystagmus again is defined in uh, many ways i'll go uh, with the the simplest which is clinically relevant and uh, which i have adopted slightly changed I'm taking this uh, thing from nelson textbook of pediatrics and Pathologically, basically, we divide it in, in two parts congenital and acquired. So, pathological nystagmus can be congenital and acquired. Now, for sake of simplicity, congenital is not like here we are talking about congenital, which uh, is right present from the time of birth basically any child who presents with these jerky repetitive involuntary eye movements bilateral or unilateral okay if you see these cases before six months of age that by would be classified as congenital that would be classified as congenital so presentation before presentation before six months presentation less than six months is congenital any child who presents afterwards that is beyond six months presentation beyond six months is acquired but simply if a child is coming up with let's say mom says he's got like these uh, strange eye movements what's the age of the child five months five and a half months goes into the congenital nystagmus category six and a half months seven months onward one year two year whatever that is acquired now again most of these cases if it is like a pathological nystagmus and if it is congenital well the majority of them would present less than six months of age because obviously this is not something which would be missed like people are looking at children faces and if there are jerky movements or something it would be picked up now again if it is laxin a child who presents with nystagmus again and i mean this is clinically relevant because let's say somebody comes up as i told you that this last week this child who came in this was five months of uh, of age and as i told you because this is such a less uh, frequent presentation nurses were confused the doctor who saw the junior doctor who saw was confused and before they discussed it with me they discussed it with pediatrics which they and they were also confused so there was like different things going on and i said when i looked into i, I will say okay well let, let me take that opportunity to explain this thing so 
presentation less than six months is congenital then the second question is whether that child who has got nystagmus has got any visual problems or he has got nystagmus without visual problem now that is the key question that's how it is classified congenital nystagmus with visual problems with visual problems number two without visual problems now this is a million dollar question how would you know that child has got a visual problem million dollar question some kids you can have an idea if the child is not having has got a lack of social smile or is not making eye contact by that time you know there is something wrong with the vision he's blind or he's got like poor vision so at least you know that the child has got a poor vision you don't know whether it's like six by 60 or six but i mean kids with less than six months obviously they can't have a six by six vision it's always like uh, six by probably 20 or something like that but still how whether it's conforming to what is normal for that age or not that requires visual sort of a examination like retinal examination but how would you do that you can't do that examination of vision in a child less than six months requires sedation anesthesia and it requires assessment by an ophthalmologist so that is the first thing to assess whether that child who's got congenital nystagmus that presents with less has got visual problems or no visual problems like you can have a rough idea of that if the child is reaching for the toys and is doing that probably the vision is fine or he might be having a poor vision but not that poor that you know where he you know is totally blind or cannot reach for the objects so it's very important for a child who is less than six months of age gets an initial assessment by an ophthalmologist to see whether there is any visual problem associated with that or not because the further investigations would depend on that so that's why if you see that that child needs to be sent to pediatric ophthalmologist so that like you know they can sort of a make an, an, an arrangement for him so that the child is sedated gas and is something and then they do what they call as a, a examination under anesthesia they do a complete retinal ex examination and see whether the child has got appropriate vision or not again it would depend on the age of the child how young the child is sometimes sometimes you can get an idea if you know the child has got visual problems and is syndromic for example a child who is totally blonde like you know white eyelashes white hair very fair very fair and has got nystagmus you know that's oculocutaneous albinism albino childs have got nystagmus why because there are not much like you know sort of a pigment in their retina so there is like foveal degeneration and macular degeneration and obviously eyesight problems can lead to nystagmus so some of the children with congenital nystagmus again who would be presenting with the visual issues because i tell you one thing majority of these kids again if you go according to statistics or epidemiology epidemiological burden of nystagmus in the majority of them would be having visual problems majority of them would be having visual problems i mean fine th rarely they can have like some neurological problem as well but again that would be less common so that's why initial assessment by an ophthalmologist is necessary all these kids who present less than six months of age they should like you know this uh, this perform my things and you need to send it to maidstone through email so that they you know sort of uh, make an uh, appointment for them and then they do the necessary eye test to see if there is any visual because i told you most of the times they would be having visual problems ocular problem so what of what are some of those common issues which can present with congenital nystagmus with visual problems let's focus on that congenital cataracts congenital cataracts so let's say if you shine and there is no red reflex in one eye or the other eye cataract congenital and congenital cataracts can have 1001 different reasons it could be because of like let's say congenital uh what you call infections like um, toxoplasmosis things like that it uh, could be because of some metabolic problems like electrosemia things like that they can have cataract 
So congenital cataracts, because of various reasons, they can develop nystagmus with visual problems. Or number two, some of those diseases which causes maculopathies. If there is a problem around the macula, which is actually responsible for your central vision, so that can lead to nystagmus. So some of the congenital maculopathies are associated with the uh, congenital CMV uh, infection, congenital cytomegalovirus, congenital rubella, congenital, uh, what else is it, toxoplasmosis. So those torch infections can cause sort of a maculopathies and those maculopathies can result in nystagmus. A third I told you is very obvious, which you can't miss. It's like a visual diagnosis, oculocutaneous albinism or ocular albinism. Some kids who have got congenital absence of iris, iris is not present. So if iris is not present, what you'll see? Big like, you know, they say, oh, well, my eyes are beautiful. They are not beautiful. Basically, they are very big, you know, pupils because there is no iris. Congenital aniridia. Congenital anaridia can occur in isolation or can occur as a constellation of uh, certain syndromes as well. And uh, then uh, ophthalmos or congenital glaucoma. If there is like sort of a problem with the development of the trapecular meshwork around the iris, that would lead to a child who is born with high pressure in their eye. We call it congenital glaucoma or bophthalmos as well. So congenital glaucoma can also cause nystagmus. So all these diseases, you see, they are causing problem with the central vision. And because of the central vision, what happens? The, you know, the eye gaze cannot fix. So as a compensatory mechanism, the, you know, the, what happens is that there is saccadic, these pursuit and saccadic movements of the eye, and it can occur in any plane. It could be horizontal when it is occurring from side to side. It could be vertical up and down or it could be rotatory. Though, later on in acquired, I will tell you that certain types of nystagmus are pathognomonic of what is going on, especially in neurological cases. But as I told you, congenital mostly, mostly is ocular problems. So if you see any child, rare, again, maybe once in a year or you, you never know. You get a child who has got nystagmus and Either you can see there might be few other features like, for example, a white reflex, uh, no, no red reflex. You can see it probably con uh, it could be what you call this um, uh, congenital cataract or maybe sometime retinoblastoma as well. You know, that can also give you these things. It's a, like a cancer of the eye, rare, but can occur. Rarely, these kids could be having nystagmus without visual problems. 5 out of 100 would be having nystagmus without visual problems. And that is simply idiopathic. So let's say he comes back after some times and the ophthalmologist has cleared him that there is no ocular problem. Fine, there might be some other problem or there might be no problem. And most of these cases have got no problem. We call it as idiopathic. Idiopathic nystagmus. There is no reason for this thing. Nothing. Or this type of uh, nystagmus might be associated with extraocular manifestations. Extraocular manifestations. So a child who has got nystagmus, okay, and has got head bobbing, he's having nystagmus and his head is also rolling like this, you know, constantly. Head bobbing, nystagmus. And let's say he has got a little bit of torticollis as well. Like, you know, he every now and then he moves his head in. That usually what they do, they actually turn their head in one direction to compensate. Because um, I want to um, clarify two things here. One is the null zone. Null zone, basically, the ophthalmologist, they use this term. Null zone is because when you are having nystagmus, basically, your eyes are not fixing on one thing. So this nystagmus can be worse in one direction. Sometimes it might be, you know, more worse in, on the left or the right one. So the child to compensate, 
what they do is they just move their neck in the opposite direction. Why? Because the nystagmus is less in that. So to see something, they might be, you know, turning their head to one side. For a child who's got nystagmus, plus head bobbing, plus torticollis or neck, that is what we call as spasmus newtens. Pasmus newton. So pasmus newton is basically nystagmus plus head bobbing plus torticollis. We had one case, I think that was uh, seen by Dr. What was his name who has gone to Canada? Dr. Ashraf. He saw one case when he was here. This uh, case of spasmus newtons, like a child who had nystagmus, head bobbing and torticollis. So spasmus newtens basically is congenital uh, nystagmus because it presents with less than six months of age and it's nystagmus plus extraocular involvement in the form of head bobbing and torticollis that is spasmus newtens and there is another term which very much resembles this in fact there is very little difference between this condition and another condition closely related and that is Opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome or Opsoclonus myoclonus ataxia syndrome. Opsoclonus, I will just write here. Opsoclonus myoclonus plus minus ataxia syndrome. So these kids, they've got nystagmus. They have got myoclonic jerks, like myoclonic, certain myoclonus, one arm, the other arm, the body jerks. And they can have ataxia as well. Now, in less than six months, it's very difficult to, because they are not sitting, they are not walking. So you cannot elicit ataxia. Simply, if nystagmus and myoclonic jerks, it's opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. If it's nystagmus plus head bobbing, that is pasmus newtens. But the question is, is just simply labeling? No. In all those cases, whether it's like spasmus newtens or opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome, they require neurological investigations. They require neurological because some of them, they might be associated with schwannomas of the optic nerve. And schwannomas inside the brain as well, in the posterior, uh, what you call this, uh, posterior force of the brain. So an MRI, MRI is important would be the next step not emergency but they do require so the next step in a child who has got congenital um, nystagmus without any visual problems let's say spasmus newtons or opsoclonus myoclonus what would be the next best step mri so this was congenital uh, nystagmus now let's move on to the acquired let's move on to this part okay So acquired nystagmus. I told you this presents above six months of age, six months. And again, those who present after six months, you just divide them into four parts. So there are four groups, just like four groups. Number one, ocular. They've got ocular problems. So nystagmus due to ocular problems. Nystagmus due to vestibular problems. That is the inner ear. No? Nystagmus due to cerebellar problems. Or other problems, I call it other, that could be any intracranial, you know, other different types of like you know just give the other problems so ocular problems now above six months of age children who develop nystagmus usually have got refractive errors high refractive errors high myopia or high hypermetropia extremely long eyeballs extremely short eyeballs because after this time, six months and onward, vision develops very quickly. 
vision develops very quickly a child at birth who can just see at this distance by the time they are one and a half year like they develop they can see up to like eight nine ten feet so vision develops very quickly but let's say if it is not developing because there are refractive errors high refractive errors so they can develop nystagma so high refractive errors are one of the most common cause of they need to undergo refraction refractory errors so high myopia hypermetropia any side like extremely nearsighted extremely farsighted or keratoconus or things like that you know anything structural problems of the eyeballs or all these things if they develop later on as well neuroblastoma retinoblastoma schwannoma if they develop the, so all those reasons minus the congenital like you know infection and things they the same problem that occur less less than six months they can also occur above six months so the same that you you know we discussed earlier can cause here as well like you know above six months of age and they cause refract then vestibular problems so if you've got problems with the inner ear labyrinthitis Meniere's disease things like that schwannoma of the vestibular cochlear nerve so that can cause nystagmus but those nystagmus are usually associated with ataxia because there is problem with the balance now the inner ear control your balance you know there have got three semicircular canals obviously the cochlea and the semicircular canal when they are affected you will be having problem with the having a taxi as well so inner ear problems usually hearing loss a hearing loss again is just like you know assessing eyesight it is very difficult in children depending on the age there are different types of tests pure tone audiometry and there are so many i mean I'm, 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 I, I, at the moment i'm not remembering like what is the definitive audi audiological test for a child of a particular age but there are wide varieties so like they need to undergo an audiology test to see if they've got like a high frequency hearing loss sensory neural hearing loss and why would a child lessen so let's say there's a history of using some drugs which might be damaging to the inner ear aminoglycosides gentamicin especially high dose gentamicin because of let's say uh, you know presumptive treatment of sepsis or something anything uti anything underwent high dose of uh, and they can not everybody but or somebody who had meningitis in early age and as a sequelae of meningitis develops hearing problem and that hearing problem affects the inner ear as well so those vestibular problems they would be having hearing issues and plus ataxia this ataxia is mostly what you call you know sort of a peripheral ataxia it's not the truncal ataxia which is more common in cerebral problems so vestibular inner ear problems though rare again as i say as taking as a whole you know if we take a proportion of all these causes and things vestibular problems are relatively rare relatively rare mostly it would be because of the ocular problems or it might be because of cerebellar problems but vestibular problems are even rare than the cerebellar problems in cerebellar problems posterior fossa tumors What is the most common posterior cerebellar fossa tumor? Again, rare, but within that rarity, what is the most common posterior fossa tumor? Anybody? Okay. It is medulloblastoma. Medulo medulloblastoma, one of the most common posterior fossa tumors. So posterior fossa tumors, medulloblastoma, there are others as well. Like you know, you can have meningioma in the same you know posterior. Cell. So they can cause again they, that would lead to truncal ataxia. 
bronchial ataxia, past pointing, all those things that you see in like, you know, in cerebellar disorders, plus nystagmus. And there is a, so one thing particular about this uh, nystagmus. This is usually upbeat nystagmus. Upbeat. Upbeat means usually it's going upward. The nystagmus would be mostly in the upward direction. For some reason, if a child greater than six months of age presents with upbeat nystagmus, obviously you have to, I mean, you can't say on the uh, per se that this would be the same, but your first suspicion would be posterior fossa tumor. If it is an upbeat nystagmus it's going in upward direction. So upbeat nystagmus is very much a characteristic for posterior fossa tumors if you see them though still you need to do investigations to see uh, because you need to confirm and then you know um, so, um, uh, you if let's say if it is more of a downbeat upbeat posterior fossa tumors if it is mostly downbeat nystagmus going like you know in the downward direction the most common cause is Arnold Chiari malformation Arnold Chiari malformation. So if it is a downbeat nystagmus, Arnold Chiari malformation. You know there are like four types of Arnold Chiari malformation. Usually type two, Arnold Chiari malformation. Uh, the thing is that uh, um, one thing more if uh, there is a, what you call a upbeat nystagmus can also occur in phenytoin toxicity in phenytoin toxicity and I told you it can also occur in uh, posterior fossa tumor as well but the way to differentiate between let's say if it could be because for number one if if it could be due to phenytoin toxicity the child would be there would be like a history that he is on this anti-epileptic medication the other thing is let's say even if they don't know the basically the the uh, upbeat nystagmus of phenytoin toxicity and the upbeat nystagmus of uh, posterior fossa tumors the difference is if the child is looking straight that is known as a primary gaze if he is looking towards you, you ask him to look towards you, you or you give him a toy if he's a small one. And if he's looking at the toy and the eyes goes up, upbeat nystagmus. So he's he's looking at you or he's looking at the toy and the eyes are going up and coming back to down, okay, in the primary case. That is usually because of posterior fossa tumor. But if there is, if he looks fine, but when he looks upward, you take the toy upward and then the nystagmus starts upbeat in the superior direction, then it's mostly because of phenytoin toxicity. So this is another clinical point by which you can differentiate if the upbeat nystagmus is possibly because of certain medications like phenytoin or is it because of uh, posterior fossa tumor. So posterior fossa tumor would be in the primary case. He's looking at you and while looking at you, fixing your eye on you or on the toy, he's having upbeat nystagmus. In phenytoin or drug toxicity, he won't have nystagmus looking at you. But if you take the toy upward, as he looks upward, then the nystagmus would start appearing. Now that is like, you know, one like sort of a clinical differentiating point between uh, what you call this upbeat nystagmus of uh, uh, drug toxicity like phenytoin or the uh, what you call this uh, uh, upbeat nystagmus due to posterior fossa tumor like uh, this what you call medulloblastoma. Downward, I told you, is ornal, mostly ornal, uh, carry malformation. Vestibular, I told you, that is usually associated with uh, hearing loss. And most of the time, the vestibular ataxia is horizontal. It's mostly horizontal. More so like in one direction or the other one. So, this was like, you know, the classification of uh, acquired Nystagma. Some of the other problems which can cause uh, are different types of ventricle. Let's say optic chiasma issues if there is a like pressure on the optic chiasma. Uh, like for example, pituitary adenoma, cella tumor, cella tersica tumors, and the craniopharyngioma. So these things, if they are pressing on the optic chiasma, so optic chiasma, you know where the optic nerves they cross each other. I think so that would lead to some form of uh, what we call this uh, what we call this uh, uh, 
homoenomious or uh, bitemporal hemienopsia. They can't see, but with that, there could be nystagmus as well, horizontal nystagmus as well. So some of the other problems, intracranial problems like optic, chiasma, humors, they can cause nystagmus. Now, the question is, we have discussed the causes, so at least now you know what could are the common causes if a child presents with nystagmus less than six months of age and what could be the causes if he presents above six months of age. You can check the nystagmus. When you are looking for nystagmus, you have to check the eyeball movements in all the directions. So make that H movement in front of the child. So, you know, a toy or something, or if he's an older one, can instruction, you ask him, like, you look at the my finger in different directions. So you take it up, down, make that H and see where is the nystagmus, you know, moments where are the words or where it appears again whether it is in one eye or in in both eyes i told you most of the time it's bilateral it can occur unilateral as well when the problem is in one eye the third thing is whether it's horizontal it's up or down or is it rotatory one um so once you've done this thing the question is what do you do after this because how would how how, how should we go forward from this point and onward so number one for Elder children, if they can tolerate, I mean, a proper slit lamp examination to look at the anterior chamber. And uh, we haven't got a, like, a, you know, back in, back, what we used to do is, like, if you have got a plus 20D, plus 20D lens, okay, and if you have got this mobile phone, okay, so what you do is, you put this, let's say, I'm talking about an older child, okay, so you dilate the pupil, putting some like you know uh, dilating and then you darken and you hold that 20d lens in front of the eye okay and what you do is at the same time you try to see through the mobile you know screen i think focusing the and you shine the light through the the and you can see the whole of retina probably three-fourths of the retina and you can see the fovea and the other things i mean doing this with a direct ophthalmoscope is very difficult number one because the child is moving the eye so it's very difficult to and the most if if you are a very good expert uh the best you can see is the optic disc but you cannot see the periphery of the retina with the direct ophthalmoscope indirect ophthalmoscope is so an older child if he have got these instruments and if you are good enough and uh, have got a good knowledge of uh, pediatric ophthalmology you can do a little bit of examination yourself to see what's going on but let's say let's say not then what should we do basically uh, we need to refer the child for a complete so investigations after a thorough history and physical is a complete and thorough ocular examination for small children it would mean examination under anesthesia it's not easy even for an ophthalmologist to keep a child still and do all these you know sort of a refractive assessment retinoscopy ophthalmoscopy things like that so that child would be anesthetized and then they have to do a complete and thorough ocular examination that might be supplemented with other types of uh, um, testing and um, these testing can be number one uh, mri of the eye MRI of the eye plus minus MRI of the brain depending on what you sometimes you're doing MRI of the eye you will do the MRI of the brain as well to see if uh, there is any problem with the posterior force optic chiasm and everything sometimes genetic testing might also be required certain types of uh, you know genetic like let's say if there is a sort of a familial history and things like that so plus minus genetic testing might be required but that's probably not the job of the ophthalmologist once he clears from the visual point of view and the child has got some syndrome or something genetic testing can be ordered by the pediatrician so genetic testing plus minus uh, depending on the presentation and thing and depending on if there is some form of uh, you know evidence regarding for example if somebody has got a cataract and he is showing uh, signs and symptoms of galactosemia so maybe you would check for this uh, uh, you know and en en enzymes to see if uh, you know the 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 diagnosis is that enzyme deficiency which is causing galactosemia or for example if you are suspecting um, 
neuroblast or something so what you'll do is you can send a urinary screen for you know uh, vma vinyl mandelic acids so we call it like auxiliary testing depending on the features so this would depend on presenting features what else presenting features are but i told you if the so usually if you're suspecting a neuroblastoma that can cause that so one of the screening tests for neuroblastoma is a urinary screen for uh, this vma vendyl mentalic acid uh yeah so uh Ma okay now briefly about the management as well though management is not our domain or something usually for refractive errors or refractive errors very small children they are given glasses slightly older children they are usually given contact lenses why contact lenses are preferable to glasses in ocular nystagmus why because if they are having this null zone and they keep their eye like this what would happen because the nystagmus is in is usually in one direction it's worse in one direction so if you have got glasses and if you have got nystagmus in this direction you still from eyes okay you 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 see these glasses cannot move with your with let's say if you're keeping your head stationary but if you've got contact lenses you move your eyes like this and that the you see that that thing moves with you so contact lenses are preferable to glasses if there is a sort of a refractive error reason for nystagmus number one number two whatever is the underlying cause that needs to be corrected so if it is a schwannoma that schwannoma needs to be taken out if it is a neuroblastoma that neuroblastoma needs to be taken out surgically or chemically or whatever if there is a tumor that tumor needs to be taken out if there is an ornal carry malformation that malformation needs to be corrected uh, like putting out a vp shunt or things like that so the treatment is the treatment of the underlying cause. There are certain drugs which can help in certain conditions. Like for example, if there is glaucoma, you can use acetazolamide or you can use beta blocker uh, topical medications like timolol or um, propenolol, whatever. But again, that is like, you know, again, that comes in the domain of treatment of the underlying cause. But as I said, if we see them, the first thing is these kids in any case need an ophthalmological examination they don't need directly to go to peds like that is an overkill basically because by and large most of the reasons are ocular reasons that needs to be cleared by the ophthalmology first and then comes back yeah i mean if somebody is presenting with uh, let's say a seizure along with that you control the seizure and then after that you know you can send them to but and that but that would be a very complex like sort of a presentation but if somebody comes with spasmus newtons or this sort of thing i first even like a spasmus okay it's okay well mine it might be an underlying neuroblastoma or something but still 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 needs the eye clearance first and then pediatrician so my friends this was all about um, nystagmus in children an infrequent yet important uh presentation and I just wanted to discuss so that at least you get an idea what could be the causes of nystagmus, how it presents, what is null zone, what is the head position, what are the some of the common uh, causes and how we should proceed if we see a case of nystagmus. Any questions now?